On the occasion of Carl Henry's 80th birthday, John Woodbridge and I edited a volume of essays in his honor under the title God and Culture. In that volume, in an essay of appreciation, Kenneth Conser wrote, quote, in the good providence of God through Carl's speaking, teaching, witnessing, and personal encounters, he has woven his life into the warp and woof of the lives of millions. The entire evangelical church looks up to him, and I share richly in this heritage." End quote. The broad sweep of that life is readily accessible in many surveys, both paper and digital, and especially in his theologically rich autobiography, Confessions of a Theologian. Yet a bare 10 years after his death a decade ago on 7 December 2003, many a young systematician in the evangelical world has never read even one of the 40 books that Henry wrote. Many an ethicist knows him only through secondary surveys. Many a pastor is largely unaware of the ways in which that pastor's own thinking has been shaped by Henry. Many younger Christian leaders who talk incessantly of missional Christianity and who think they are tying together Christian confessionalism and social concern for the first time in the modern era <laughs> are painfully and embarrassingly unaware that a giant charted this landscape before they were born. And many Christian educators, both in seminaries and in universities, have little idea of Henry's visionary commitment to excellence, faithful scholarship, engagement, and influence in the worlds of, and ideas of tertiary education. Part of this, of course, is nothing more than the brutal effects of the passage of time. Most people are largely forgotten in a generation or two, or at most three, even by their own families. It is given to very few to be cherished in the memories of peoples and nations. And even when it does occur, the memory is often seriously distorted. The person has become a beloved but somewhat distorted icon. Many people revere the names of Wesley or Calvin without ever reading a single book they wrote and with only a hazy knowledge of when they lived. The picture scripture casts up in this regard is plainly true. We human beings are like grass or at best like flowers growing in the grass. But the season ends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, and only the word of our God endures forever. It is good for our humility to be reminded that the most prominent of us will, should the Lord not return first, be utterly or at least almost entirely unknown in a hundred years. Nevertheless, a public memory that does not seem to be able to survive for even 10 years is somewhat surprising. Worse, some who happily call themselves evangelicals seem more intent on debunking Henry than on learning from him. Eager to demonstrate that Henry's magisterial God, revelation, and authority is nothing more than a theological relic that has passed its sell by date. We must not overlook what a towering figure Carl Henry was. His reign as editor of Christianity Today helped to establish his intellectual leadership. In the 1970s, Richard Osling of Time magazine called him evangelicalism's leading theologian. Some of his works were paradigm shifting, not least his 1947 volume, The Uneasy Conscience of Modern Fundamentalism. The six volume magnum opus, his greatest work to which I've already referred, God, Revelation and Authority, published between 76 and 83, showed he was far more than a scribbler of journalistic articles and occasional books. Timothy George has argued that in the mid 20th century, Billy Graham and Carl Henry were the most important shapers of contemporary evangelicalism. Not a few of today's senior evangelical systematicians, such as Millard Erickson, Gordon Lewis, Bruce Demarest, affirm the shaping influence Henry had on them, not to mention some young ones, such as Russell Moore and Greg Thornbury. Doctoral students sometimes write dissertations on Henry's life and thought, including the executive director of the Gospel Coalition, Ben Pays, who was working on his dissertation here at Trinity. Carl Henry was one of several young leaders who earlier worked together to start the National Association of Evangelicals. His international influence multiplied during the years after he was appointed lecturer at large for World Vision, 1974, 
His mentoring of Chuck Colson and his subsequent work with Prison Fellowship were largely behind the scenes, but no less influential for that. During his career, he taught in several institutions that helped shape American evangelicalism, including early Fuller Theological Seminary, Eastern Baptist Theological Seminary, and of course, Ted's here. In 1966, Henry and Graham were the primary movers and shakers behind the World Congress on Evangelism held in Berlin. The friendships and networks established there led directly to the 1974 International Congress on World Evangelization held in Lausanne, often referred to as Lausanne One. That Congress is organically tied to the most recent Lausanne Conference held in South Africa last year. The figure of Carl Henry towers over the landscape. Mercifully, in this centenary year of Carl Henry's birth, a handful of scholars are doing their best to prevent the dissipation, the, the, the dissemination rather, to, forgive me, to prevent the dissipation of the Henry legacy, let alone the fading of his memory. Not least is Greg Thornbury, whose important book, Recovering Classic Evangelicalism, Applying the Wisdom and Vision of Carl F. H. Henry, is neither biography nor lament, but an appeal to build on Henry especially his epistemological foundations, to recapture and build up what he calls classic evangelicalism. The conference sponsored by the Henry Center explores numerous facets of Henry's thought, including his subtle grasp of the importance of history and biblical revelation, his hermeneutics, his sophisticated rationalism in which he distinguishes, in Keith Yandel's words, between incomprehensibility and ineffability. That is, it is possible to know and articulate literal truths concerning God, even if this infinite God outstrips all human knowing. And then, of course, also his ambitious plans for a Christian research university, which, because Henry was a man of his own times, was sometimes dubbed Crusade University. Another Henry conference is scheduled at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville. These conferences will doubtless result in published papers that will play their part in reminding a new generation to whom Joseph means nothing. Before I come to the point of this address, there is a point, bear with me. It might be helpful if I list three reasons why some Christians have sought to marginalize Henry, quite apart from the universal tendency I mentioned at the beginning of this talk namely the tendency toward remarkably rapid forgetting once a thinker has gone to his reward. Number one, not a few critics have focused rather negatively on one element of Henry's thought without attempting a broader and necessarily more positive evaluation of the man. I could not begin to count how many times I have read that Henry was a Christian rationalist or a philosophical modernist or, worst of all, an epistemological foundationalist. Usually uttered with the same dismissal one reserves for charging someone with an addiction to pornography or pedophilia. <laughs> to take but one example, this one from a normally reputable source, Alistair McGrath, he dismisses Henry's understanding of revelation, labeling it, quote, purely propositional, unquote, stemming from Henry's regrettable enslavement to the rationalism of the Enlightenment. This sort of criticism has two serious flaws. First, it is not more than mere labeling. As far as I know, the foundationalist label was first applied to Carl Henry by Hans Frey at Yale, when the latter was ticked with Henry because of Henry's review of Frey's book, The Eclipse of Biblical Narrative. Over against classic, liberal, destructive source criticism, Frey was right to emphasize the inherent power of biblical narrative and its importance for interpretation, and many of his contributions were extraordinarily helpful. But Frey wanted to maintain this stance while continuing to adopt the conclusions of the earlier liberal criticism, even if he rejected their methods. Henley rightly saw that issues of truth are at stake, propositional truth. If all that Fry read of Henry was that one review article, I can see why he might have inferred, wrongly, that Henry was an unreconstructed foundationalist. But I find it difficult to imagine that any intelligent critic who has actually read Henry extensively would make the same mistake. Regardless of the reasons, that label and its associates stuck. <laughs> 
even at the hands of Henry's fellow evangelicals who should have known better had they taken the time to delve into Henry more probingly. It is an axiom of the best of academic debates not to apply to one's opponent labels that that opponent himself would disavow. That courtesy has not been extended to Henry. Second, much of the criticism of Carl Henry is focused on this one issue, epistemology, how you know or how you think you know. There has been much less criticism of his zeal for, his, for evangelism, his vision casting, his call for a research university, his understanding of personal and social ethics, his Christology, his theology proper, that is his doctrine of God, his attempts to interact with the secular world, his commitment to historic evangelicalism, and much more. Carl Henry has often been neglected on all of these issues because he was already dismissed because of his ostensible old-fashioned foundationalism. In short, not a few critics have focused rather negatively on one element of Henry's thought without attempting a broader and necessarily more positive evaluation of the man. Now, I suppose I should say something about the substance of the epistemological issue, since I've waved some red flags. If, if you are not interested in theology, and this is already just getting a little heavy this late in the evening, this is your time to get a two-minute snooze. I'm going to get just a wee bit technical, and then I'll come back to the land where we all live. <laughs> Although Henry repeatedly insists on the truthfulness of the Bible's propositions, it is a serious misreading of Henry to imagine he thought that all revelation is nothing but propositions, or to suppose that access to such propositions rests on the, presupposition, on the foundationalist presuppositions of the late Enlightenment. On this point, uh, as far as I can see, Dr. Thornbury has Carl Henry exactly right. Let me quote our previous speaker. Henry stressed the absolute dependence of human knowledge upon divine disclosure, whether natural or particular. In other words, according to Henry, we know what we know because God wills both the possibility and the content of that knowledge. God circumscribes and determines what can be known. Nonetheless, the world remains knowable because God himself is an intelligent deity. Contrary to the trajectory of rationalism, no autonomous standard for reason can be offered since reason itself loses meaning apart from the divine character. Since the divine discloses himself as a person, revelation is personal in nature and can therefore speak to all of humanity. Consequently, revelation both coheres and corresponds to reality because God is one. It is not a truism to say, therefore, that divine revelation is communication that we can trust. Every condition of knowledge, that is, every justified true belief, therefore stems from an allowance of either common or particular grace to the end that we live in the world God has actually created and glorify the agent of that said creation, Jesus Christ. Or, let me come to the words of Henry himself. In a sense, all knowledge may be viewed as revelational since meaning is not imposed upon things by the human knower alone but rather is made possible because mankind and the universe are the work of a rational deity who fashioned an intelligible creation. Human knowledge is not a source of knowledge to be contrasted with revelation, but is a means of comprehending revelation. Thus, God, by his imminence, sustains the human knower even in his moral and cognitive revolt. And without that divine preservation, ironically enough, man could not even rebel against God, for he would not exist. Augustine, early in the Christian centuries, detected what was implied in this conviction that human reason is not the creator of its own object. Neither the external world of sensational nor the internal world of ideas is rooted in subjectivistic factors alone. Or one more, Peter Hicks, British theologian, has Henry Wright when he says, Henry's central thesis is that God reveals and speaks. There is no reason why we should limit God to one form of revelation through either a person or a book, through either encounter or concept. God reveals and speaks in a number of ways, in his creation, in general revelation, and supremely in Christ, the incarnate word. But additionally and foundationally, he is able to formulate and communicate truth in an epistemic word in which he articulates truth verbally through intelligible disclosure. And this, in sovereign grace, he has chosen to do. In short, Henry's epistemology is in the line of the Augustinian reformed heritage with some wrinkles of his own. 
Henry absolutely refused to think of epistemology from the bottom up. He began with God and worked down. Now that's the first reason, the biggest reason for some have for dismissing him. Second, one of the reasons why Henry is not better known is because he has written so much, and much of what he has written is not particularly easy to read. <laughs> it is not quite fair to say that Henry's prose is turgid, although that has often been said. Rather, Henry presupposes that his readers enjoy the same mastery over eight-cylinder words that he does. <laughs> Moreover, his cultural background has infiltrated enough of his thought processes that um, the length and structure of his sentences often achieve almost Germanic magnificence. <laughs> Those who enjoy skimming their theology will not find Henry very palatable. Similarly, although Henry preached pretty often, he was always more of a lecturer than a preacher. Number three, one of the overlooked reasons why Henry is not widely read today is that when he wrote, he thought, like the journalist, he was trained to be. This means that he was constantly interacting with the thought leaders and cultural trends of his own time. That is part of what made Henry so influential when he was alive. He was clearly abreast of the thinkers and writers who swirled through the century, especially the early and mid 20th century. But for exactly the same reason that makes his, makes his books seem out of date today. Even when his ideas are important and have the potential for crossing generations, Henry, journalist that he was, carefully tied them to whatever was going on in his own time. The six thick volumes that constitute God, Revelation, and Authority can be summarized in 15 fairly simple theses. The substance of those theses Henry unpacks, of course, but a very great deal of his space is devoted to unpacking these theses while interacting with scholars and other writers whom none but experts read today. So Henry's work sounds more esoteric and dated than it really is. This is true of almost all of Henry's books. His uneasy conscience was prophetic in 1947 and is still worth perusing, not least because it's short. But it is not cast so much as a biblical theological essay serving as a textbook for several generations of students but as a tract for the times grounded in an urgent, thus says the Lord. Of his substantive books, perhaps the one best cast as a textbook is his Christian personal ethics, the revision of his second doctorate. Thus Henry's relevance and power in his own day, carefully tied to the most influential tides of his time, are precisely the things that make him sound dated today. So at last I come to the nub of my argument and then I'm done. Why should we esteem Carl Henry so highly today? What in particular does he have to teach us that we are ill-advised to ignore? Who was Carl Henry? I shall take three steps. Number one, a summary statement. Here I have an apostolic number of points. Relax, they're all short. <laughs> one, he was a trained theologian with a PhD from Northern Baptist Theological Seminary, 1942. Until his closing years, his breadth of reading was prodigious. He was a theologian who kept reading, not only within his first discipline, but across a very wide variety of interests. Number two, he was a philosopher with a PhD in the subject from Yale, 1949. The kind of philosophy that was taught at the time helped to ensure that he was perpetually interested in the big picture, in how diverse strands of thinking did or did not cohere. His dissertation, which traced personal idealism and Strong's theology, ensured he was bringing his academic disciplines together. Number three, all his adult life he was a writer, an editor, and for parts of his life, a journalist. The latter ensured an outward-looking stance. He was never interested in philosophical and theological ideas constructed for other specialists alone. He could see what ideas meant and desired to work them out on the world at large. So theologian, philosopher, writer. For all his life, he was interested in ethical questions, not only in an academic sense, his Christian personal ethics was one of the more challenging books I read as an MDiv student, but in a prophetic sense. This was not only a function of his comprehensive vision of the outworking of the gospel, but a function of his knowledge of Christian views in earlier generations and his own compassion for the poor and the oppressed. Number five, everywhere and all the time he was an evangelist and interested in those whose calling it was to be vocational evangelists, 
Not for a moment did he think that his massive learning and considerable responsibilities exempted him from the obligation to be a faithful, joyful witness. In retirement in Watertown, he found a way to start a citywide Easter sunrise service where the gospel was preached. He found ways to share his faith with ordinary folk who had no idea of the mind inside the kind man who was talking to them about Jesus and the cross. Number six, his travels made him a world Christian. In his later years, when Carl and Helga lived in Watertown, Joy and I tried to drive up to see them about two hours away every six weeks or so. Our conversations were wide ranging, but sooner or later he would ask where I had been recently. Almost always, he had intelligent observations about the country or city in question, often attached to questions about the state of the church there, whether such and such a leader was still serving and the like, even though it may have been a quarter of a century or more since he had been there. His Christian faith was never jingoistic. Number seven, he was an educator. Not only in the sense that he taught at several institutions of higher theological learning and wrote to inform and instruct, not entertain, but also in the sense that he longed to see established a great evangelical research university, willing and able to engage with the intellectual and social currents of the day. This dream has not been fulfilled. It is not yet close to being fulfilled. We are still wrestling with questions about the conditions needed under the good hand of God to bring such a dream to fulfillment. I would dearly love to weigh in on the matter, but that, of course, would transmute this address into something else, so I refrain. But if the dream is no longer thought to be quite as unattainable as it once was, if there is new spark to try again, that is due in no small part to Carl F.H. Henry. Number eight, he was interested in history, not with the technical eye of the professional historian, where Henry had few skills, he was not a good historian, but with two foci. First, his evangelicalism was never the stuff of the last 20 years or the last 50 years or the last 200 years. He wanted to be in touch with the church of the last 2,000 years, the church that was devoted to and controlled by the evangel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Second, he saw more clearly than many how the historical claims of the gospel are essential to any true and cogent grasp of the gospel. For example, for him, there was no space for fuzzy notions about the real space-time event of the resurrection of Jesus. I was going to tell you the same story of his interaction with Karl Barth, but probably the entire universe knows that story, and it's been well re-articulated by Dr. Thornbury. Number nine, he was an entrepreneur. Scholar and writer though he was, it took an entrepreneur to envisage and then begin Christianity Today and to organize the Berlin Congress of 1966 and bring it into being. Number 10, he was a family man. My own connections with Carl and Helga were fairly distant when their son Paul was still alive, and by the time I got to know them well, their own decline was well advanced when their daughter was diagnosed with cancer. So I refrain from speaking of what I do not know. But I must add that those I have known who knew Carl and Helga best testify to the quality of their home throughout their entire life. And it was nice to sit at the table and overhear some of these stories coming back uh, tonight. 11, he was a mentor to many. His interest in individual students was hugely respected by successive generations. Of course, some held themselves distant from the great man, for in his public persona, he was equipped with the gift of intimidation. Not least because of his encompassing mind and fulsome vocabulary, but those who managed to get to know him found him to be humble, eager to encourage, thoughtful, often other-oriented, and remarkably free of pretensions. One of our students picked him up at the airport some years before he stopped teaching here, drove him onto the campus, and the student, in suitable reverence and holy awe, said to the great man as he passed that wing of the library where the words are written, the Carl F.H. Henry Resource Center. He asked the great man, what does it feel like to have your name on a large building? <laughs> Carl replied, feels like I should be dead. <laughs> 12, above all, he was simply a Christian. At the age of 70, he was asked what he treasured most. He replied, Jesus Christ as personal Savior and Lord. Into the darkness of my young life, he put bright stars that still shine and sparkle.
Second, a pattern from the beginning. Carl Henry was one of a most remarkable group of young evangelicals who pursued doctoral studies at Harvard at the same time. The group included John Gerstner, Roger Nicole, Samuel Schultz, Harold Kuhn, Harold Greenlee, George Turner, Paul Jewett, Edward Carnell, George Ladd, Stanley Horton, Lemoyne Lewis, Kenneth Conser, and others. Anybody who has studied theology of the 20th century knows that these are giants who roamed the land. They were all at Harvard at the same time. Yet in some ways, Carl Henry was the leader of this club. Conser wrote, Carl did not know as much Old Testament as Sam Schultz, who was completing his work on Old Testament under Charles Pfeiffer. He did not know as much New Testament as Harold Grant Greenlee and George Ladd, both studying under Henry Joel Cadbury. He did not know as much of the history of doctrine as Paul Jewett and I. And he did not know as much philosophy as Harold Kuhn, who was assistant to Arthur Darby Nock, chairman of the department. But on all crucial points, he knew enough to argue intelligently, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, with any of us. In short, he already had the makings of a first-rate evangelical theologian leaning toward philosophy of religion. No evangelical theologian who bases his or her understanding on the norm of scripture and seeks to communicate that faith effectively to the world of scholarship around us can ignore any of these fields. Not least, Carl Henry knew what was going on in the world. Carl, moreover, was never afraid of new ideas. His emphasis was always on the big picture. Above all, he sought to think clearly and effectively, consistently and comprehensively about the total Christian world and life view. From the very first, he exhibited an impassioned desire to serve God with a mind. This combination of concerns, in my judgment, is the key to Carl's life and ministry. Now the point of the point, integration. The problem with the picture I have sketched is that it may give the impression of bits and bobs. But Carl was not, as it were, a theologian and an educator and an entrepreneur and an evangelist and so forth. He forged these strengths into one life, one Christian life devoted to his Lord and Savior. He was in the old 17th century sense the complete, P-L-E-A-T, Christian. That is, with a comprehensive grasp of the totality of the gospel. For all that we need thinkers and leaders who carry specialist strengths, the church cries out for pastors and teachers who join these many strengths together in the service of the King of Kings. In the 20th century, it is hard to think of a better model than Carl F. H. Henry. Thank you.